Hello and welcome to this event on the government's new subsidy control regime. I'm the IFG's Chief Economist Gemma Tetlow and I'll be chairing today's event. The UK's new subsidy control regime replaces the EU's state aid regime the UK has been part of uh, in recent decades. And this is one of the first major policy areas where the government has chosen to diverge from the EU approach. But will it deliver a Brexit dividend? And what will the changes that are currently being legislated for mean for parts of government and businesses that grant and receive subsidies? Taking a new approach offers the opportunity to focus on UK specific concerns in a way that the EU wide system couldn't cope with. But ripping up the rules risks creating legal uncertainty and a badly designed system could mean poor regulation of subsidies. I'm really pleased to be joined today by all of you and by our expert panel to discuss how the government's proposals in the subsidy control bill stack up against the pitfalls and opportunities that there are in this area. And to help us dig into that, uh, we have four panelists today. Peter Foster is public policy editor at the Financial Times and has been tracking all things Brexit uh, for a while now for the FT. George Peretz QC is a barrister at Moncton Chambers. Thomas Pope is Deputy Chief Economist at the IFG, and Rahat Sadiq is an economist at the Confederation of British Industry. Before we get into the meat of this event, just a few brief housekeeping rules for you. Please do start sending in your questions using the Q&A function. Um, if there's already a question there that's similar to the one you wanted to ask, please just up like the existing one so we know that it's popular. And if you're happy to add your name and where you're dialing in from, please do so that we know who we're talking to. We'll be live tweeting today's event from at IFG events using the hashtag IFG state aid. And I think Peter Foster is also planning to tweet along. So please do keep an eye on that and tweet along with us. Today's event is on the record and a recording video and audio will be available on our website within 24 hours if you want to listen back or if any of you don't manage to catch the whole thing. So with a short presentation from Tom, uh, just to give us a quick overview of what's going on in this area, and flagging some of the opportunities and risks that the IFG has highlighted around the new subsidy control bill. Tom, over to you. Great, thank you very much, Gemma. And yeah, I'm aware that not everyone will be familiar with the ins and outs of state aid and subsidy control, let alone exactly what the new bill says. So I'm just gonna briefly talk about, sort of outline the area here to get people up to speed. When we're talking about subsidies in this area, what we're talking about is transfers from governments and public bodies to businesses that are selective, so they're available to some businesses, but not all businesses. Why would a government want to have a legal regime that might restrict the use of subsidies? Well, one reason is just to ensure good value of taxpayer money, make sure that subsidies are actually achieving the change that they're meant to, and that they're not distorting economic activity. But particularly in a system where subnational governments have the power to offer subsidies, um, there's a risk of subsidy races where different areas compete for activity in a way that's damaging for the country as a whole. Um, and you see that quite a lot in the US, for example. Now, actually, there aren't many examples of legal subsidy control regimes around the world. And if we're talking about domestic regimes, like the type the UK is going to set up, really the EU system is the only game in town. Um, but the UK is going to set up a new system, actually already has a new system, um, and it's required to do so as a result of the trade and cooperation agreements. So excuse me, very briefly, very high level, what does the EU state aid system do? Well, effectively, the European Commission plays the role of gatekeeper. Any subsidy that might affect trade, and there's quite a low bar for that in the EU system, is considered illegal unless and until it's approved by the Commission. There are two routes for getting your subsidy approved. One is to notify the Commission, which will then evaluate the benefits and costs against a set of criteria. That could take six months or more, and they'll let you know whether or not uh, you can do your subsidy. Or alternatively, if you want a quicker and less uh, uncertain route, uh, you can go for automatic approval via the block exemptions, which are effectively long checklists uh, for your subsidy to meet. If you meet all of those criteria, then the EU uh, Commission is happy that uh, your subsidy is unlikely to distort activity, and therefore you can do it automatically. So what about the proposed new UK system? Well, it will work very differently. Gone is the presumption of illegality of a subsidy until it's approved. Instead, we have a system that will be based on private enforcement. Public bodies and governments are required to self-assess um, whether their subsidy 
complies with seven broad principles. For example, will it meet a, a public policy objective? Is it proportionate? Does it minimize impacts on competition and investment in the UK? It will then um, register that on a database and interested parties, which could be say a competitor business, will then have 28 days to start the process to bring a judicial review, effectively a court challenge as to whether that self-assessment of compliance with the principles is reasonable and correct. There is another body involved in the system, but it's got nothing like the power of the commission in the EU regime. The subsidy advice unit is going to be set up in the CMA. Um, for some subsidies that might be distortive based on uh, criteria to be determined, the analysis that public bodies and governments do about compliance with the principles will be sent to the CMA for review. The CMA will publish a report. Um, it may raise concerns, but it has no power to block some subsidies, and nor could it be an interested party challenging it in court. Um, one final thing to say about uh, the new UK system and how it works is the role of schemes. Subsidies under pre-approved schemes cannot be challenged um, during using the mechanisms in the bill. Schemes can be set up in two ways. Um, they can either be set up by public bodies in the same way that subsidies are, so self-assessing compliance with the principles, putting it on the database, waiting 28 days to see if there's a challenge. The government will also set up its own version in streamlined routes. So will this be a successful system? Well, the first thing to say is that at the moment, we're very much judging the skeleton of the system rather than the full detail. Uh, the bill leaves lots of important information to be filled in in secondary legislation, for example, which types of subsidies will be referred to the CMA. But just looking at that framework, actually, I think there's there's a lot to commend it. And it's pretty similar to a system that we proposed at the IFG in a paper published last year. And it's appropriate in a UK domestic context to have a more flexible system. And there's an opportunity both for smaller subsidies offered by local authorities and larger subsidies designed by the government departments to, uh, to work with less administrative costs. However, there are risks. The subsidy advice unit is weak, um, has few powers, and the 28-day challenge period is very short. And that, combined with the role of schemes, I think does risk leaving some harmful subsidies to slip through the net. We don't know exactly how the Competition Appeal Tribunal will take on its role of judicial review, what will be considered um, sufficient evidence that you're complying with the principles. Initially, at least, I think that may, means there is likely to be some hesitancy from some granting bodies, at least, but that's likely to uh, dissipate as the system beds in. There's a limited role for devolved governments, even though this will impact on devolved competence, both in rulemaking and governance. There's been no reform, for example, to the governance of the CMA, and the Secretary of State has some unique powers within the system that devolved ministers do not. And finally, Article 10 of the Northern Ireland Protocol says that subsidies that will affect trade between Northern Ireland and the Republic will still be subject, subject to EU state age rules. If that's interpreted very expansively, that could leave lots of big subsidies offered in Great Britain still subject to EU rules. And if that were to be the case, that would um, kind of blow a hole in the UK system because the most important subsidies would still be being litigated in Brussels. There's no guarantee that that is the case, but that is a risk. Um, and after that whistle stop score, I will hand back to Gemma. Thanks very much, Tom. George, I'll come to you first. You have a lot of experience with the EU state aid system. What do you make of the new bill? Do you think it's set to deliver a better system for the UK? Whether, you're, whether it's a better system or not rather depends on who you, who you are. I mean, if, one way I think of looking at this is to, is to think about different perspectives. I mean, if you're a granting authority, what the new system um, gives you is that it avoids the old EU problem that you either put what you wanted to do into the safe harbour of the block exemption regulations, which was often limiting and confining and constrained what you could do. And if you weren't able to do that or didn't want to do that, the only option you had was to uh, go to uh, the European Commission. And if you weren't central government, that meant going through central governments so involving another actor uh, and then getting the, the, the measure notified and approved by the Commission, which, as Thomas explained, has 
took, took time and effort and cost. Uh, under the new regime, um, if you want to do something which is slightly outside the, the, the norm, life is a lot easier because all you have to do is go through the, the principles, address them, satisfy yourself that they all apply, uh, and then um, off you go. Uh, and there may be on, um, subject on, on some cases, minimal number of cases, a sort of uh, cross-check by the CMA, which isn't in any event going to be uh, binding. So that's the advantage if you're a granting authority. Disadvantage if you're a granting authority is, as um, Tom pointed out, and it's all sort of the flip side of, the, of not having this, this, this safe harbour of the regulations, is that you are on your own. And in a case, in a case which were formerly fitted comfortably into the Bond exemption regulations, you now subject to the possibility of there being schemes under the new um, Act, you're going to have to do some work yourself to go through and think about the way in which the principles apply. And as Tom also correctly pointed out at the moment, it's not entirely clear, but it simply isn't clear what level of scrutiny the CAT will actually engage in. Judicial review covers a number of different levels of scrutiny. So advice as to how much level of detail you need to go into and what counts as satisfactory evidence and whether you really need to get economists advice to back up, um, you know, bits of economic analysis that you may want to do are all a bit at large um, and uncertain. And that uncertainty may put people off granting subsidies that should be granted. So that's the granting authority perspective. From a challenger perspective, the old regime had the advantage that if what you were challenging was a state aid and it wasn't notified, it was completely slam dunk because the whole thing was uh, unlawful and had to be set aside. The new regime is more complicated. Um, uh, in that respect, because um, you have you got to, 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 to persuade the Competition Appeal Tribunal on, on judicial um, uh, uh, review. Uh, on the other hand, under the old regime, if a measure had actually been cleared by the European Commission, it was very difficult, but not completely impossible, to challenge it because you had to go to the General Court, uh, and that tended to apply quite a light standard of review to clearance decisions by the Commission. Um, final just point I want, and I think this is a disadvantage to the current system. And I'm not quite entirely sure how within the framework it's dealt with. Um, but it, it, it's the position of measures that are subsidies, but where the public authority thinks they're not. Um, and that actually can happen in all sorts of areas. It happens in tax cases, uh, where there's, uh, uh, you know, un a, 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 under the Clause four, for example, you can see that's quite difficult issues as to whether some tax measures are subsidies or not. That uh, happens even more commonly if the local authority or public authority making a grant is taking the view that it's only doing what a private investor could do. Um, and that assessment is, to put it gently, not always entirely uncontroversial. And there's room for considerable disagreement about whether that test is, a, is, is applicable or not. There are going to be cases, I think, of subsidies, of, of measures that really are subsidies, where the public authority rather over robustly takes the view that they're not, and therefore doesn't engage with the system at all. There will be no transparency, nothing will go on the register, and it will be left entirely to private enforcement to spot such cases. Now, in the EU regime, you have the Commission as a universal policeman. I mean, here, you, you're back to, you know, the situation as it was in London before the Metropolitan Police, you're relying on ordinary citizens to do the policing job. And that may work in some cases where you have a competitor with a deep interest that's really concerned by a, a, a measure. It won't work so well where, you know, there, are, there, aren't, there isn't any company that's particularly concerned, but then may nonetheless, looking at the economy as a whole, be a considerable degree of, uh, of damage. Thanks very much, George. There's lots of interesting points there, which I'm sure we'll come back to lots of those in a second. Um, Rahat, going to you next. The subsidy control bill that's going through Parliament is really aimed at telling government bits of government what they can do, but obviously the impact of the system will have major implications for businesses who might be receiving subsidies in future. What are the things that your members are most interested in or concerned about with this new system? Yeah, so I think just looking back, a lot of our members welcomed the opportunity really to consider where improvements could be made in the UK's 
subsidy regime and rather than kind of replicating what we were familiar with from kind of the EU state aid framework. So I think that was a, a conversation that businesses really welcomed. I think our three priorities kind of looking back to last year were on, on speed, um, on transparency and, and on ambition. I think on speed, kind of obviously that <laughs> the criticism has been that kind of things like the general block exemptions regulation kind of did sometimes often, uh, often that like a straitjacket for some of these kind of really um, large investments or, or investments that have really high upfront costs. And I think the new bill kind of does address that in some ways of enabling it to be more flexible and a bit more light touch. I think the second point and transparency, I think obviously you're thinking about not just who is awarded the subsidy, but the competitors and kind of what disadvantage that might cause and making sure those kind of checks and balances are in there. Um, so there was a concern about transparency, I think making sure we know when and how a subsidy was awarded. And I think the current even the website itself and uh, the government website and subsidies doesn't necessarily provide all the information you might want to know kind of when <laughs> when a subsidy was announced on the website isn't, isn't necessarily there. So I think there are very small changes that could be made um, to the way th the bill has been written and designed just to make sure that businesses have the confidence in and the robustness of the system, even if, even if there is this kind of self-enforcement and kind of self-policing that has to go on. And I think the third point was about ambition. And I think within this conversation, it's it's helpful to know now what the framework in general might look like, but we've not, not had that conversation um, with the government and, and, and with the business community about what so how subsidies will be used at all uh, and kind of what the per, what the role of subsidies are going to be for the UK and then therefore how often this regime will kind of come into practice and how kind of difficult or kind of easy it will be. It's, it's all good and well having a really light touch system but if it's not going to be used or actually it'll be used and then kind of misused I think that could cause problems and we're kind of as business is really unsure um, what that looks like. So I think it's generally a positive direction of travel but I think there are lots of kind of unanswered questions. Thank you very much. Peter, this new subsidy control regime has been hailed as one of the major first Brexit dividends. Um, from your perspective, what, what politically does this need to deliver to really be shown to be a Brexit dividend? Thanks, Emma. Uh, it is interesting, isn't it? Like so many of these Brexit dividends are hypothetical. And as George said at the top, uh, a lot of this remains still quite hypothetical in theory. We've liberated granting bodies to make their own decisions. Uh, as Kwasi Kwarteng said, that should empower uh, um, uh, the sector. It should, in theory, give the UK something of a competitive advantage. It should be quicker to get major subsidies through the system for gigafactories or, 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 or some, something that, that delivers on net zero. Um, the EU system was uh, very cumbersome. Now, whether it will or not will, of course, be the, the, the million dollar question you know for a lot of people you know it will be a question of whether or not um this system really does deliver targeted benefits that answer many of the problems that the, the country's got you know if you look at our, us against oecd averages you know the productivity is down now these investments could be really important for enabling the post-brexit economy on the other hand they could just be a port barrel fest um, you know, we'll talk later about the devolved administrations, um, but I'm already hearing from the devolved administrations, for example, on the um, what's going to replace EU structural funds, uh, um, uh, the shared prosperity fund. I'm already hearing complaints that, um, you know, the Westminster government is taking the power to sort of strategically direct funds out of the hands of the devolved administrations. The 22 unitary councils of Wales are having to apply for funds and that's leading to duplication and cross cutting. And so, you know, we wait and see a lot on the detail uh, of how this is going to be administered. But I think, um, you know, we won't know until sort of five, ten years from now whether actually the post Brexit economy, and there'll be obviously lots of other things muddying the data, has been helped by a, a nimble system, which in theory this, of course, should be. You know, the EU state aid re regime is designed to create a level play playing field for 28, uh, now 27 economies. This is a scheme for the UK, designed and built for the UK, and it only has to worry about the UK system. Unfortunately, I guess the last thing I would say is, you know, if you if you sort of if you want to be gloomy about it, you look at how, for example, the towns fund that pre that the that pre preceded the uh, the levelling up fund was administered, it doesn't necessarily inspire a great deal of confidence that this um, won't make 
grants um, both more complicated, more confusing, uh, and, and also potentially more political. Thanks very much. Um, I mean, just to get into put a bit of um, flesh on the bones of this talking about more flexibility to meet sort of UK government priorities that perhaps were constrained within the EU system. What sorts of things, are there any, is there any evidence so far of the sorts of policy priorities that perhaps the UK government has and wants to channel subsidies towards that weren't covered uh, within the EU sort of block exemption rules? Um, Tom, perhaps I come to you first on that. Yeah, I, I think it, in many ways it is, it, it's a slightly complicated picture, of course, because actually EU state aid rules we've already established are not a blanket um, ban on, on subsidies. In, in many ways, lots of the ways that the government's focused on improving the system, how it's hailed the, the new system relative to the EU rules is on, is on process as much on particular examples. If you look at what the UK government's priorities are, net zero, levelling up, clearly there are going to be subsidies there um, that will need to abide by this system that would have needed to abide by EU rules. But I, I don't think we can say with confidence that those are subsidies that would have been prevented in the EU system. Perhaps there'll be more flexibility. There's one example um, where we do already have a concrete policy announcement is on free ports, where contrary to what some people say, free ports are not banned within the EU system, but there are severe restrictions within the state aid rules as to what free ports can be. And probably there will be some more bells and whistles on UK free ports than there could have been within the EU system. But in terms of concrete examples, that's probably the, the main one that I can think of so far. Peter, have you picked up from your conversations with government any sort of particular directions of travel where they're looking to use this greater freedom? In, in, in macro, but not micro. Uh, you know, I mean, in some ways, the system is designed to be a bit more organic. Um, I mean, clearly, there are there are some big policy areas. Gigafactories is one. The UK is way behind in investment in gigafactories. It really needs to catch up. We've seen a couple of awards coming down the pipe. That's a big one. Net zero is a big one. We haven't yet got into regreening the housing stock and how we're going to move uh, towards building uh, electric vehicle infrastructure, to getting people to take up heat pumps and insulate their homes. So there, there's some quite obvious big areas. Um, I guess, you know, the Freeport uh, example that Thomas makes is quite an interesting one, you know, because actually, you know, Freeports classically are there to arbitrage the difference between input and output tariff costs. But if you look at the TCA, they're, they're basically, you know, the Sussex Trade Observatory did a load, did, did some crunch the numbers and found that apart from, I think, in pet food, raw pet food ingredients, there really isn't a, a free port, classical free port upside. So then you have a situation where the free ports are essentially enterprise zones. I mean, you can call them free ports, but it seems to me they're increasingly going to look like enterprise zones. And I think it's pretty questionable from a lot of the research that's done on free ports and on enterprise zones, which, by the way, we had pre-Brexit, whether they actually develop, deliver really good upside to the economy. So again, you know, you don't want to have a system where which is flexible, which is essentially enables bad policy making, which, you know, you could make a pretty good case that free ports are. Example, I mean, George, you, you mentioned the sort of lack of clarity about what the test would be on these subsidies and whether they're appropriate and being used. If you take the sort of free port example, would, would there be any case for challenge on that sort of a subsidy or how, how would this be treated? Um, well, I haven't sort of thought through precisely how Freeport would be challenged. Uh, challenge. I mean, in 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 you know, in general, what is required is you need a complainant, and they need to act very quickly as soon as the subsidy is placed on the database, and then they need to go to the competition appeal tribunal and show that there was a judicially reviewable error and applying the principles. So that means not it's not no good just to say you know the. I disagree with the way in which the local authority or granting authority has approached this, but there's some sort of fundamental error of reasoning or error of law in the way in which that's been done. Now, quite what that is, I made the point earlier, quite what that means in the in in this context remains yet to be seen. And there's certainly an argument for saying that because the competition appeal tribunal is marking um, the home, you know, it, it, because it's facing a situation where a public authority is marking its own homework, the public authority decided it wants to do something and that it's sort of, as it were, deciding whether it can. And that's a situation where it's there's obviously a sort of starting political driver 
that it should be a bit more intrusive and prepared to question than it is when it looks at the decisions of the CMA when it's acting as an impartial regulator in a merger's case, for example, where the CAT has tended to be quite hands off and to say, well, it's up for the CAT to CMA to, 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 to take a view on these um, you know, sort of fundamental economic issues. And we're not really going to question its judgment on this is clearly gone barking mad or clearly failed to address some really important point. We'll have to see. Um, I mean, as for freeports in particular, I haven't sort of thought through precisely how that would be done, but that's that's the um, that's the, the general rule. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I mean, one point one. I mean, it's point just just to, to make a point about the EU system. I mean, the, in practice, when the UK government wanted to do something and it involved spending a lot of money, it would and it didn't fit with the block exemption. It would go to Brussels and it would normally get it cleared, normally with a few. Tweaks. There's lots of examples of that over the last 20 years of notifications from the UK. I mean, I entirely agree that I think a lot of that is about, a lot of this is about process. It isn't so much that the UK is going to be able to do things that it just, things that it would actually want to do, that, that it couldn't do under the EU system. It's just, it's going to be quicker and easier to do it. And obviously process matters, as any lawyer knows, because sometimes the process is too complicated, things just aren't done. Um, but it isn't that as if there's you know, that the, 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 there's a sudden barrier li lifted to doing really important things that the UK was simply unable to do in the EU. That's simply not the case. George has flagged, as did Tom, about the, the danger, that particularly in the early stages of this new system, there's just uncertainty about how these rules are going to be applied and what the standard for challenge will be. To what extent are your members concerned about that? And is that going to make businesses less eager to engage with the government and take subsidies? Yeah, I think it is a good point. And I think kind of even in some ways it is too abstract for a lot of businesses that, and I think similarly for public bodies that don't have kind of specialisms in, in subsidies, it, there'll be a lot of catching up and there'll be a lot of learning to be done. Um, so I think that will be one challenge. I think also just because you're not sure what the government's priorities are, I mean, we can guess, I mean, we, we can kind of think about what the Build Back Better strategy has been from the government. As Peter said, it's quite high level and we can kind of do a lot of guesswork as where we need to do a lot of catching up. Um, that, that's based on speculation. I think because we have those missing parts, it can be difficult for a business, especially if you don't have that expertise in-house, um, to really think about where you could benefit from the system but also where kind of the, there are holes and where you um, might be a bit more concerned. I think if we had a bit more detail about what it looks like in practice, so our members for instance say um, sufficient evidence kind of that that term is, is really too vague e even in, in previous iterations and kind of understanding what is sufficient enough. You don't want to be writing, showing reams and reams of information if it does include commercially sensitive information but also if you're seeing competitors or kind of other public bodies awarding a subsidy with very little detail, kind of just basically where that consistency would be and kind of narrowing down that requirement of even sufficient evidence would be really helpful. George, are you, are you starting to see a rush of new business to you with people trying to figure out what the rules are? Well, I think there is a, an, a, an issue of um, businesses trying to work out what the, the, the risks are and and of course, on a lot of these issues, if you go to lawyers and say, well, you know, this is the this is the grant that somebody is offering me and they say they thought about the principles. Um, I mean, this the, though this is a new re, new regime introduced under the bill, we're sort of living with it now in terms of the transitional regime under the TCA. Um, so you get these issues now and somebody comes to you and says, well, we're told that the local authorities thought through these principles and can we safely take the money? And your advice is inevitably not going to be, oh, absolutely, definitely, you can, there is no risk. Um, you know, it's not an area of certainty. I mean, what one can say in reasonably strong cases, I wouldn't spend too much time worrying about it. It's not, it seems to me the risk is one you're commercially justified in taking. Um, uh, and, you know, there are various degrees of worry that one may express, but you're never going to hardly ever going to be in a position of saying, oh, absolutely, certainly, there couldn't ever conceivably be anything to worry about. And, you know, business have to learn, as we all have to learn, to, to, to work through what that actually means in practice. 
Peter touched on the question of the devolved administrations and their powers within this system. Um, Tom, what, what does the new system mean for the devolved administrations and is that sort of appropriate in the way they're being treated? Yeah, so for the devolved administration, so subsidy control was reserved by the Westminster government, meaning that it was for Westminster to legislate in the Internal Market Act in 2020. Um, but it very much impinges on devolved competence in that you know, it's, it is in devolved competence to offer subsidies, and that's something that they will continue to do and will want to do. I think it's slightly difficult to talk about the changing situation for the devolved administrations, because if you compare it to the EU system, actually, because this is a system that gives granting authorities more flexibility, you know, set their own policy objectives, for example, a bit more flexibility in design, relative to the EU system, they're probably better off. They have, they do have more control. But given how much power we have taken back from Brussels, um, given the fact that I mean, this is a, a four nation system, it's in the interest of all four nations of the UK to have a system. I think the fact that the devolved administrations are treated no differently really than say a, an English local authority or any other small public body is not quite appropriate, particularly with regard to say whether they would be able to challenge subsidies. It's not clear, for example, um, if there were a subsidy that were taking activity or a risk of taking activity from Scotland to England, for example, it's not yet clear whether they would have standing to appeal that. By contrast, the Secretary of State has special powers that allows it to him to call in um, special reports from the CMA if there's a subsidy he's worried about, and also to that he has automatic standing in courts as well. So I think it's that asymmetry as much as anything that's um, that's causing problems as it is the devolved administrations losing control relative to previous systems. I think, so given that this is a, a four nation system for the interest of all four nations, there should be more form, more of a formal role for the devolved administrations, for example, in setting the rules. At the moment, there's, there's some role for consultation, but that can quite easily be bypassed. And also in the governance of the, the CMA, given the critical role it's playing in this and also in um, the Office for the Internal Market as well. I think it's worth looking at that again as well. I mean, I think uh, if I just sort of add something to what Tom said, I mean, in terms of the asymmetry, there, there is an, uh, an asymmetry in standing. It may, and this is something that's turned uh, up in the debates uh, uh, in the House of Commons, the, the, the difference on standing may not be quite as great as certainly I originally thought. Um, the minister in uh, statements that would certainly be cited in court um, on the interpretation of this has said in terms that he regarded the provision as it currently stands as conferring the power of on, on a devolved government to uh, go to the competition appeal tribunal if, if it was a case that it could, was concerned genuinely affected business in its area, which of course the situation where it would want to do so. So I think my original concern on that may not be quite as, um, uh, as, as as strong as it was, given those clear statements by the minister in, in, in Parliament. But there is an asymmetry in terms of referring to the CMA, where the, the Secretary of State can, all, can, can often do that, um, but the devolved governments can never do that. Um, I mean, part of the answer that's been given when these uh, issues have been raised in in Parliament. What the what the Secretary of State or what the Minister says is, oh well, you don't need to worry about this because the UK government acts for the whole of the United Kingdom. But I think the problem with that answer is that you know it's it's sort of true that the the UK government acts for the UK government in relation to subsidy control because it's a reserved matter. But as Tom Tom has made the point, the problem with all of this is there's subsidy control regime penetrates deeply into areas that are definitely within devolved competence, such as agriculture, such as education and training, such as economic development. So it gives, the problem with it is it gives the UK government a potential, various levers to intervene in matters which clearly are within devolved competence. And that's why I think the answer that, oh, well, the UK government is acting for the whole of the United Kingdom is a bit unconvincing. I mean, it will, will often be the case, the measure in question is one which the UK government is very keen on, but it's keen on looking at through an English perspective, because it's a matter that it's a measure it's very keen on, 
because it, de it develops the economy in England. And in thinking of that through that, it may not have thought very much about Scotland or Wales. So you know, you've got these issues, um, which I don't think the government answers are entirely convincing now. Peter, you raised this initially. I mean, is it this asymmetry between the power of the Secretary of State and the devolved administrations that's the real problem? And is, is the problem here really getting at other political tensions that there are between the current government and the devolved administrations? Is that what's the of this? Yeah, I mean, let's not let, let's not be naive here. You know, this is a government, you know, Michael Gove, uh, you know, is very determined and keen to protect the union. Um, you know, crudely speaking, uh, if you, you know, the internal market bill has given the central government the imperial power, imperial capital in London, you know, much greater powers to dish out money, essentially with a union flag stamped on it. Um, you know, I mean, I say that crudely, but I, I, I confidently predict you've already seen, you know, protests from the Welsh and Scottish governments over the way this is being done. Um, the government, you know, is under pressure on questions of the union. That's been, you know, they've been highlighted by COVID. So absolutely, these new post-Brexit regimes prevent provide the government with levers to, um, you know, to, to as they would see it, strengthen the union. Now that may or may not backfire. It may lead to poor spending of money, and it certainly will lead to the Westminster government dishing out money in areas that have been devolved for a long time. Um, you know, uh, uh, and therefore um, the will, that will cause, I think, um, that will cause political noise. Um, I think more, the more, more serious question is whether it also leads to bad policy, to bad grants, to money being given out in a non-strategic way, uh, uh, you know, um, in a non-joined up way, um, that ultimately means that the money doesn't have the impact that everybody wants it to see um, in in areas that that need the uplift. Tom, in his remarks, uh, noted the role of the subsidy advice unit and suggested perhaps it could have a bit more of a beefed up role within this system, um, perhaps to investigate things on its own uh, back. Georgia Rahat, do you also think that perhaps the subsidy advice unit could do more within this system? What's your take on the powers it's been given? Uh, I, I'm happy to start that one off. Um, I think generally there was a bit of hesitancy really for the CMA to have kind of large enforcement powers uh, on subsidies. I think that that was a bit of a worry for our members. So I think yeah. the fact that we've not gone that far in terms of the, the powers of the independent body is a positive. Um, I think it's also quite positive that, as kind of Tom mentioned, that the subsidy advice unit and the office for the internal market are within the same body. I mean, it's not quite clear how busy the CMA will be on both of those fronts, but I think the fact that there'll be that knowledge sharing, that te technical expertise within the same function will be quite reassuring to understand the nuances and kind of the details um, of, of both subsidies and protecting the internal market will be really important for our members. I think there there is a question though generally about the CMA having kind of lots of things dumped on it at the moment. It's got this miscellaneous bag of doing the digital markets unit, the microeconomics unit, and, and then kind of these two additional functions. And I think until we perhaps know how busy they'll be, it might be that they're doing lots of very, very important things and kind of don't have the capacity or the resource um, to do that adequately. George, do you have anything to add to that? No, I, 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 I mean, I, I, I agree with that. And I think there were, you know, there were some concerns um, about, there were some concerns, and the concerns about putting this function within the Competition and Markets Authority, um, and there were obviously advantages in terms of synergy and so on, but I think the, the, con the concern expressed by people who were concerned about it was that the CMA might approach some of these issues with just too much of its ordinary competition law hat on, and there is a difference between the way in which one one approaches the subsidy issues, the way in which one approaches competition uh, law uh, issues. Um, of course, they're managed together in the Commission, in the, the, the state aid functions within DG Com. Um, but there's a fairly, you know, in practice, the, the two divisions are quite separate. And I think there's a bit, and for good reason, because there is there are differences in approach and analysis that one wants to make. I'm sure the CMA will do its job right, and the fact that it's, in a sense, a constitutionally separate unit, um, uh, distinct from uh, other parts of the CMA, may help avoid a sort of inappropriate spillover from other areas of competition law. 
it's already the issue of the Northern Ireland Protocol and how this interacts with this new subsidy control regime. Peter, from your sort of looking at the politics of this, do you think this is a real danger that the Northern Ireland Protocol could mean that GB subsidies get drawn back into being looked at by the European Commission and what are the politics of that? So uh, it's an interesting one. There's only one case that I'm aware of, uh, um, which is a, a, a case of British, British sugar against the government trying to argue that um, a decision that Liz Truss took to take uh, uh, some tariffs off sugarcane imports amounted to a subsidy that's going through the courts at the moment. That cites Article 10 and Article 10, of course, um, because Northern Ireland is in the single market for goods, um, uh, the, the Article 10 of the protocol says that any decision on subsidy control by the UK government that impacts, um, George will correct me if I got this wrong, but will impacts the goods market in Northern Ireland should be referred to the Commission. Now, you will remember there was a big wrangle about that, going to, to the point about the politics over that during 2020, when they were trying to get the modalities of the um, uh, uh, protocol nailed down. And it ended not with an Article 10 being rescinded, but with a sort of unilateral statement from the British government saying the way that they foresaw um, Article 10 operating in a very sort of light, what touch distant way. Um, and then quite quickly after that, the Commission put out its own statement, which pretty much said we still see Article 10 as having you know, a, a, a deep reach into the United Kingdom. And that, I think, really upset the Brits. George uh, and James Weber uh, have written a very good paper, which argues essentially that given that we are now going to have a subsidy control mechanism in the UK that adheres to the principles that were set out in the TCA, and given that Article 10 was created at a time before this mechanism had been fleshed out on the UK side, and in fact, at a time when the UK was saying, well, Canada doesn't have any subsidy, formal subsidy control regime, so we're not going to have anything at all. There must be a case, logically, that the protocol Article 10 should be softened, rewritten, even if it's done over time, uh, uh, as the UK regime demonstrates that it works and it, and it adheres to the principles in the TCA. Um, for the moment, I can tell you, the Commission is nowhere near um, wanting to go there. You know, the politics of this are absolutely that the Commission does not want to open the protocol, which you'd need to do to rewrite Article 10. It just doesn't want to open that Pandora's box. And, you know, I've, I've talked, you know, to lots of Euro senior European diplomats about this and about, the, you know, the clear logic in, in, in George and James Weber's paper. Um, and, you know, the, the response you get, I paraphrase, is really, well, you know, good luck, good luck trying to get DG competition to, 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 to um, agree to that. So I think Article 10 is there to stay in the near term. It's the most sensible bit of the July command paper asking for rewrites of the protocol, in my view. Um, you know, I, I guess George will have a much clearer view about how much the British government should really be concerned about Article 10, because I'm not so clear on that. I'm not so clear really in practice. Is it going to become a big thing or not? I just don't know. George, do you know that? Yeah, I think at the moment it's very difficult to, to, to know. It's certainly an issue that um, I, I and other lawyers have come across in practice in terms of giving advice. And I can certainly think of a number of cases in which I've advised where it has been a real issue and where in particular the difference between the UK's approach and the Commission's approach um, hasn't actually mattered. So one saying to oneself, the Commissioner right, there seems to be an Article 10 case, if Fraser right, it isn't. And that obviously generates a certain amount of uncertainty. Um, I mean, you know, we wait for case, for, for case law on this. Um, at the moment, there's no, I mean, I'm not aware of any ongoing DG comp investigation or notification based on Article 10. Um, there may be there may be some in the offing, which I wouldn't necessarily know about. Um, I mean, I think you, one could see that there's the material there for a major dispute and potentially a really politically quite explosive dispute if the Commission and the European Court of Justice took the view that a measure that really looked pretty much GB focus rather than Northern Ireland focus was in fact subject to the EU state aid regime because of what might be described as a fairly incidental effect on cross-border trade in goods between Northern Ireland and the rest of the EU. I could see that that could blow up into something quite explosive, um, but so far it hasn't happened. So <laughs> we wait and see. 
um, as to what, and until one really has some case law, it's it's hard to to to, to take it much uh, further. I'm going to add questions uh, from the audience. We've got quite a few coming in. The first uh, comes from Sarah Murray of Local London, who points out that in the new UK system, there is nothing like the assisted area map that was in the EU system of channeling funding to the most disadvantaged areas. Do any of you have any thoughts on that? Does that mean that those types of areas are going to fare less well? Tom, come to you first. So I think, that, yeah, the, the question, I think George has put it this way in other places, really, is there anything in the system that would favour supporting Grimsby over Guildford, say? And clearly in the EU, you have the explicit assisted area map that says, you know, you can give more support in areas that um, have lower GDP per head, essentially. There's nothing explicitly like that in the UK system, but then we are going for a principles based system. So you wouldn't necessarily expect something so explicit. And if you do look at the principles, I think there's something there that would actually make support in poorer areas easier to sort of comply with the principles than others. So there's a, an explicit equity rationale included as an example of a policy objective. It's presumably easier to show that your measure is proportionate, that it's generating economic change generating economic activity that wouldn't have otherwise happened if you're in an area that's got less economic development versus one that does. That doesn't mean that the UK government couldn't introduce something like an assisted area map. I think if it did, that would probably be more in the form of, say, a streamlined route or something like that. And that would be the place to add a bit more detail. But I don't think there's something in the system per se that means that this is a system that's kind of biased against more disadvantaged areas. I think there are ways that um, you know it's there implicitly and could be made more explicit further down the line. Did anyone else want to come in on that one? No, I, I agree with that. Great. Um, next question then is from Ian McCartney, who's former Minister of State at DTI and former Minister for Foreign Affairs and Trade. And he's flagging his particular concern about the scope for there to be competition between the four nations trying to attract activity to themselves away from one of the other nations. We've sort of touched on this already, but to what extent do you think this is a real risk? And is there something that could be tweaked within the new system that would reduce the risk of this happening? Anyone want to start on that one? Well, I mean, the, the way it's dealt with within the system is that um, when you're contemplating giving a grant to, you know, some factory or, or, or distribution centre, which is touting itself around and saying we could locate anywhere within the UK. I mean, when you, when you actually come to, to think about the grant that you're going to give it, you've got to go through the principles and those will include um, you know, essentially, sort of, is it the is it the minimum necessary to get the company to come and locate here? Does it distort um, competition within the UK? Those are relevant principles. And if you've had a subsidy race that's ended up with some inflated amount, then you're not going to be able to satisfy those principles. Um, and if you try try and satisfy them through implausible reasoning, presumably the other affected or, or areas of the UK will challenge you in the CAT. So there are some uh, constraints. There is a, a rather peculiar clause, um, clause 18 in the bill, that um, prohibits any subsidy which is conditional on a relocation um, within the UK. I have to say that that seems to me, I mean, the reason why I say it's peculiar is because, and the minister confirmed that this is the right reading, it only applies if the grant is expressly conditional, not just on your locating the factory or whatever it is within your area, but on the grantee closing down the factory in the other area. Um, and this, this becomes slightly unreal because in practice, you know, if you're, if you're a local, if you're the Scottish government and you're spending a whole lot of money attracting a widget manufacturer to Kilmarnock, um, you're, you're going to want the widget factory built in Kilmarnock and you're going to say that's what you want, but you're probably not going to write into the contract and you must always also close down your widget factory in, in Kensington. Um, so it's slightly unreal, um, but uh, it, it may be seen as a sort of pointer to a, a you know, sort of to, to 
it might have value as a pointer that in general in policy terms subsidies that ha even have the effect of relocation is if they don't aren't expressly conditional on it and not really should not really be within the scheme but that's that's quite vague anyone else want to add on that one I suppose as to whether it's a kind of genuine concern, I mean, I, I said in my presentation, I think it's a, it's a very good reason for us to have a subsidy control regime. And obviously, to an extent, it's a hypothetical problem because we've had EU state aid rules which have constrained the extent to which this could happen. But if you look at other countries that um, don't have similar rules, and the US is kind of the extreme example, you do see these quite damaging subsidy races cropping up, for example, Amazon HQs and, and, and all of those. And I think you know, we shouldn't be um, we, we, yeah, we shouldn't be certain that those things wouldn't crop up here. I think that given that the bill is going to be there and given that the system is going to be there, I think that does significantly reduce the risk. At, at the very least, it's going to make it a, a difficult argument, as George says, to, um, to show that such a subsidy actually complies with the principles. Next question then is from Alexander Rose, who I'm sure people will be very familiar with if they've spent much time on this area of policy. Um, he asks, what steps do you think the government should take to ensure that the streamlined subsidy schemes, the safe harbours, that Article 10 of the new bill are fit for purpose? Should they run some sort of consultation or set up a task force with experts from the public and private sectors? Um, Rahat, do you want to start on that? Yeah, no, that's a really good question. I think uh, even just broadly, I, we would welcome engagement with the business community a bit further into what what the functioning of the subsidy regime will look like. Um, I, I think we haven't we've kind of thought about the hypothetics um, and kind of we now have the bill, but I think that conversation, whether it perhaps it doesn't have to be formally a task force, but I think even if there is some kind of consultation process, um, that would be really helpful. Just thinking about both how the framework could work, but also um, through cases, I mean, we're not talking about the entire economy that are affected by subsidies, um, even looking to the future. So I think having those conversations with the sectors or the, the industries that are generally going to be affected by the new regime and the approach that public bodies will have um, will be really important for our members. Peter. Yeah, I mean, just a kind of reportedly comment, really, which is that talking to kind of local government lawyers, etc., um, they are crying out for certainty um and and they're used to the old block exemption system um they're obviously going to have to adapt to a new system um but they you know bear in mind that they often have limited capacity etc and therefore it's all very well saying we're going to have a more empowering freedom system but in the real world it needs to be a system from what they tell me that they can use um and and i think that's quite important i mean another thing i'd also mention is the question of clarity which is Obviously, it's a very short appeal period, 28 days, um, and a lot of that relies on this website. You know, there's supposed to be transparency and the website. Um, talking, in fact, to, 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 to Alex Rose and others, the website is a mess. Um, and, and it's not clear really whether it's a mess by accident or by design. Most government IT is a mess, of course, um, by, you know, just by, by default. But, um, you know, if the government is serious about having a kind of transparent, nimble, excellent system it's going to have to make sure that that website allows people to go on and go well hang on um you know to george's point about subsidies that are given confidently by public bodies that are private bodies you know considered to be distortionary um they're going to end up in a world of pain if the website is continually continues to be not fit for purpose yeah you picked up on a question that actually fiona wish had also put in the Q&A about the, the quality of that database. I mean, Rahat, you mentioned this in your opening remarks as well. D do you have any view on whether is it getting better? Um, is this a teething problems or is this an ongoing concern? I mean, hopefully the fact that it's been mentioned uh, by so many of us on this panel kind of perhaps indicates that it's been raised multiple times, um, not just to kind of um, a parliament, but also to kind of civil servants as well. Um, but I think this wider point as well on um, engagement and coordination, I don't think it'll just necessarily be with the public bodies and the local authorities that we might be kind of ha thinking about in the back of our minds. I think for areas like uh, research and development, our members actually mentioned that granting authorities really don't speak to each other often and you're kind of it's they're funding pots from different departments that aren't coordinated. And I think having that change of culture, even in things like this, of actually if you want to easier system also then does need to be kind of that better communication across departments that are trying to make kind of R&D funding um, a, a lot better. 
Thank you. Um, next question from Jonathan Smith. Um, he asks, isn't it ironic that these proposals rely on access to judicial review for challenges at the very time that government is seeking to restrict access to judicial review? Do any of you have any views on that? Are we, is this a system that's now relying on something that's otherwise being sort of undermined in its credibility by, by government? George. Yeah, I, I suppose that's for me. I mean, I, I, I can't do much, I think, other than um, note the irony as, um, as, 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 um, uh, as, as you say, I mean, I'm not sure how much the government's general proposals for judicial review would have any particular impact um, on, it, on this area. Um, it has to be said, but but yes, I, you know, sort of note the point. Did anyone else want to come on that one? I, I, I suppose just the, a point that I made in George Rissa is exactly how judicial review works here is going to be really important as to how well the system works in practice because if it's a judicial review that in practice gives a lot of a lot of rope a lot of deference to the um, reasoning of the granting authority then actually you could have some, some subsidies that if you were just looking at it objectively you might think probably do violate the principles but if if the the cat is only taking a very light touch look then I think that's where we might begin to worry that a system of private enforcement actually isn't doing enough to prevent the types of subsidies that uh, we really want. That was why we we recommended, and others did as well, that the CAT should take it on. They're slightly more sort of technically minded than, than general courts. You might expect a bit more interrogation of, of the analysis, but you know, the way judicial review works will be key to how the system operates, whether it's effective. Peter, now from George. You know, yes, I have always a question for Thomas and George, which is, is it designedly so? When you look at the 28 day period, you look at the database, you look at the at the cat, you know, is actually, you know, if we want to have a nimble system, you know, is it actually designed to have essentially, you know, what is much more of a free for all? It might end up to not very good outcomes in terms of the value for money, as it were. But is it actually designed that in practice the system is going to be quite unenforceable and quite chaotic? And that's the point. Well, I mean, I think what I would say is, I mean, I think the 28 day limit, which is very short, is really only workable if the transparency da database really contains the sort of bulk of the stuff that genuinely gives you enough to work on, you know, as a legal advisor to say, hey, I can see that there really is an issue here because, they, you know, it, 28 days involves a lot of movement very quickly. So you've got to, you've got to, you, you can't spend that time trying to work out what's going on. You've got to have the information in front of you. Um, I mean, one thing the government does say about the 28 day limit is slightly sort of paradoxical is to say, oh, well, you need not worry about it too much because what you can do is you can extend it because you can ask for information from the granting authority uh, under clause 76. And that has the effect of suspending the of restarting the one month time limit. It starts again when you get your information and the granting authority has 28 days with which to, to re reply. I mean, that's a slightly odd defence because if you're really saying you don't need to worry too much about 28 days because you can always get it extended by using this device, why just not have a longer period to start with, um, which would make life a, a, a lot easier. Um, but it, but it is very, it is, it is a very short uh, period, and the comparisons, comparisons, which are made um, to sort of defend it with other periods where there's a very t tight timetable are not really apposite because those are cases where the person concerned has already been deeply involved in the case. So, you, you know, merger cases, for example, where, you know, the, the typical appellant is the unhappy merging party being told it can't merge when it's been deeply involved in a merger procedure in front of the CMA for the last six months. So it knows all about what's been going on. But here, all of the challenger is going to be often, probably typically, somebody who's not been involved in the decision at all up until the date when it suddenly appears on the transparency register. So it's a really a standing start, which makes the 28 days very tight indeed. We are actually now at our time. I'd just like to try and squeeze in one very small, quick question um, before we finish, which has come up with a couple of questioners, um, which is the question about whether there is perhaps an external constraint on the UK government's use of subsidies if other countries, including perhaps the EU, judge that these subsidies are anti-competitive internationally and therefore start to impose uh, retaliatory um, tariffs on UK goods. Is, do you see that as being 
a, a likely constraint? Are they are other countries in the EU likely to act at any point? Um, yes, I mean it clearly is. I mean, if you look at WTO litigation, it's the you know subsidy complaints about subsidies is a major field of activity, at least when you have WTO litigation, which got blocked at the moment. Um, well, I could easily see the EU taking um, action. I mean, one of the one of the arguments for having a system of subsidy control domestically, and particularly for having the CMA involved in some of the bigger cases, which it will be, is that actually in some way that will strengthen the UK's hand internationally. I mean, if you had a hugely important subsidy on a major project with big international repercussions, where one could well see potential complaints from the EU or other trading partners, because the at the subsidy was just so big, the fact that the CMA had been all over it and presumably had said, yes, this is fine, it complies with these subsidy principles, it's proportionate, all the rest of it, that might actually be quite helpful in deterring litigation in the first place and then being used to support the UK's case when if litigation happened. So that seemed to me to be an, a fairly strong argument for this type of legislation. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, we are very much out of time now. We could have carried on with this conversation for much, much longer. So um, hopefully we can come back for another event on a similar topic for too long. Um, thank you all very much for joining us. Um, huge thanks to our panellists, to Peter Foster, George Peretz and Rahat Sadiq. Uh, thank you for watching and do join us for our next IFG event on the 27th of January when we'll be launching our annual Whitehall Monitor looking at the size and shape of government. Thank you very much.